Okay, we're on this uh, creek back that runs meanders through this swamp for miles and miles, and it's really low right now. You can tell it's all muddy. Usually that's, that's all underwater. And basically that creek, because it's so mucky, that's probably two foot of muck there. Deer are not gonna come across through that, uh, but they will skirt that edge and they'll come down through the edge of the swamp. And I, so that actually acts kind of as a pinch point where all that marsh grass over to the right of it those deer are gonna to have to come around this corner and come down this edge, which will bring them within range of my tree that I'm getting ready to prepare. Okay, just pan along the edge of that creek, which is gonna act as kind of a pinch point. All those deer are gonna funnel down the edge of that creek, come down through the swamp, stand along the edge of that creek. And this here is the tree. This here is the tree I chose to hunt back in here. Uh, there's quite a lot of oaks in here and I'm going to be up up by uh, this here's a maple but there's a lot of oaks around here I'm gonna be up in that second crotch so I'll be up there probably 25 to 25 27 8 28 feet and anytime I'm in a tree this small I consider this an extremely small diameter tree uh, I like to get up high I like to get up out of their peripheral vision so the plan is with the camera what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk, the way you prepare a location properly is you find the tree at the location where you have the most shot opportunities around you. Obviously at a destination spot, you only have to key on one location, but we're back in a swamp, we're in a place where deer are gonna bed, deer can come, there's runways all around this tree. So basically what you need to do is you need to take your farthest runways from the tree and while you're walking those runways, you look at the tree and then you find the spot where you have to clear out the least amount of brush for a shooting lane. And when you clear out that to that farthest shooting lane, that farthest runway, that's gonna bring any other runway that's between that one and the tree within, you won't have to you know, you clear out a separate lane for that. Because when I clear a lane, it's a straight open path all the way to that far runway. So anything between that will also be a, shoot, you know, a shooting lane. And then I do that to every runway that's the most distant runway going by the tree. And this spot here, I'm probably gonna have four shooting lanes. I think they're pretty much gonna be every 90 degrees. Because you, I don't know if you wanna pan over on that big dead log, that big dead tree. <laughs> That, that big tree there is kind of acting like a buffer. The deer are not gonna cross it because it's up too tall. So the deer are gonna skirt around the outside edge of that and that, there's only about a 40 yard gap between the outside edge of that tree and the creek, maybe 30 yards. So they're gonna skirt around that and because they have to skirt the edge of this corner over here, this creek winds a lot, you know, they're gonna be within 25 to 30 yards. Everything on any of those runways going north and south. And then on this side of the tree where the stump uprooted, they're gonna skirt around the outside of that. So anything coming through this side of this marsh grass, and this gets really tall in the fall, you know, they're gonna skirt around that, so they're gonna be within 10 yards. So I got a runway here, I got a runway there. There's a couple runways going that way. There's a runway going around the edge of this root system that's going that direction. Uh, and also I chose this tree because this particular tree, I can get up high enough and it's a tree where I have to do the least amount of clearing. If I chose one of these trees in here, I'd have to cut a lot of trees down. This tree, I've got to cut a few small trees down to open up some shooting lanes, but not a lot. This whole area out here is going to be open. I don't have to cut squat out there. Uh, yet deer are still going to go through there because it's going to be tall marsh grass. So uh, I'm going to come back over here and kind of go through the process of walking the runways while you're looking at the tree to pick out the spot where you have to clear the least amount of stuff to get a shot to the tree from the farthest runway. And also something that's really, really important, and a lot of guys make this mistake, once you pick your shooting lanes, you clear your shooting lanes first. Most people prep the tree, get up in the tree, prep the tree, get down, prepare their shooting lanes. Always prepare your shooting lanes knowing where you're gonna be in the tree. Then once you get up in the tree, you're almost 100% of the time, especially in a swampy area, you're gonna see stuff that you missed once you clean the tree out where you're gonna hunt. 
There's going to be stuff that you missed. So you can make mental notes and then when you get down, you can clean that stuff up. Because lots of times if you prep a tree, then you prep the shooting lanes and then you leave, you come back to come hunting in the fall, uh, you get up in the tree and there's stuff you forgot to cut. This way you prep the shooting lanes first, prep the tree, note the stuff that you missed, get down, cut that, and now it's going to be clean for when you come back in the fall. Okay, there's the tree right in front of us, that maple tree. It has a fork in it, and then up on the right-hand fork, up about 25 feet, there's another fork. That's where we're going to, that's where I'm going to prep this. And as you can see right through here, there's lots of stuff to cut. So you walk the farthest runway like we're doing, and right here, this is where the least amount of stuff is they have to cut. So this is where we're going we're gonna to clear this out right here to that spot up in the tree. And this is going to be the shooting lane, and this is going to bring anything between here and the tree, any other runways going that direction, uh, going north and south, is going to be open to shoot as well. So this is the place where the least amount has to be cleared out to the farthest runway from the tree this direction. Okay, as you can see, that, that tree has been dead for a few years, obviously. And when you follow it to the left, you're going to notice there's a runway skirting the very edge of it. So that tree is actually... Uh, acting as a pinch point. It's, it's forcing the deer to go around one side of it or the other because they can't go through it. It's too high off the ground. Here we are at that tree and walking down the other side of the tree to show you the other runway. Found here, a deer's bedding in here. I don't see any other beds, so it's a good chance this is a buck. And you can see right here, there's lots of belly hairs, lots of white hairs all over the place. So this is a place a deer has been bedding quite frequently, uh, which is kind of cool. That's the pur purpose of this tree being here. This is going to be a uh, primarily a pre-rut spot where bucks are going to be in here searching for uh, early estrus does. This is definitely a bedding area swamp. I love these kind of spots. This is awesome. Here's uh, this is that big tree I'm going to show you in a second, but here's another little sliver of a runway, not too far from where that bed was. And it kind of funnels right around the end of this stump. This is where the roots are, where that tree tipped over. And uh, right here is another place where deer have been bedding. Deer have been bedding right here real close to the end of this stump. So you got this runway. This tree acting as basically a pinch point, funneling deer down on both sides. And got a runway going that direction kind of going northeast to southwest. And there's another runway. There's actually a V right here. You can see that runway there. That's a little skinny one, but the major one is just going north and south right off the end of this stump. Okay, here's a spot where it comes down the edge of this swamp and it kind of fans out here. So you got a runway right here, got a runway right here. This is the most north-south runway. So this is the one we're gonna walk. So we're going to walk down here while we're looking at the tree. The tree's right there, that veed maple. And obviously, right here, this is it. The least amount of stuff has to be cut right here, almost nothing. And that's what I said, when you get this, is because this is more on the marsh side. There's not as much timber as there is on the other side. Um, there's hardly anything to be cut here. A few branches here, that little brush right there and a couple branches off the side here and this is wide open. Nice run from last year. Okay I'm just walking this uh I'm walking this runway on the west side of the tree going north. It's going due north and south. And this is the farthest runway where we were going to prep over there. So I'm looking for runways going east and west. And it looks like this one right here is going to be the farthest runway within my shooting capability. So this is the runway we're going to walk while we're looking at the tree to find the best shooting lane for this runway and putting everything else into shooting shooting distance within inside that distance also so uh, that's what we're going to do we're going to walk this one now okay right here's uh this is that east east west runway 
cutting off that one going north and south. This one goes due east, north, or east and west, north of the tree. And right here, you can see there's lots of trees over there. Right here, there's a little gap. So I've got uh, probably 25 yards, not a whole lot of stuff that needs to be cleared out right through this swatch. And there's probably three runways between here and the tree, aside from this one right here. So that'll, just clearing that out, will have all of them easily open for shooting. So I'm not going to need four. I'm only going to need three. And they're almost, they're almost all exactly 120 degrees from each other. Got one that way, that way, and that way. Going to have a shooting lane pretty much northwest, uh, due east, and uh, to the south, due south. Okay, get out the trusty old silky. Anytime you're clearing out a runway or a shooting lane, make sure to throw the stuff where it's not going to interfere. I hate cutting this big tree, and I might not. I may look at that. Anytime there's small brush that's relatively close to a runway, I like to cut it because it doesn't take much to deflect an arrow. Okay, I'm standing at the base of the tree. We've cleared all the runways, Joe and I, and uh, not runways, shooting lanes. <laughs> Let me start over. Start. Okay, I'm standing at the base of that tree out in the swamp, and uh, Joe and I, my son Joe helped me, and he's actually on the camera right now. And actually, that's the first shooting lane that we did. So uh, you saw it before, and now if you pan out on it, I think you can see how clear it is up to that second crotch. I haven't cleaned the tree yet. I haven't prepped the tree. Prepped the shooting lanes first. Then we're gonna, now we're gonna prep the tree, but that's the first lane. We ended up doing four lanes. Two of them needed almost nothing. That one needed a little bit of clearing. You can see these cut off trees. So that's lane one. This here's lane two, and I wanna say one thing real quick. Uh, if you could zoom in on this, because I can't really tell when we were doing the lane clearing because we didn't film it, but 
these little sticks like this, you know, if you got a little stick in these little sapling shoots, if they're right in front of a runway where they could possibly impede a, impede a shot at a deer's chest, make sure you take those out. A lot of times they're only, you know, this tall to this tall this time of year, but when you if you don't cut them out by fall, they're gonna be that tall. And if they're in front of the runway, they'll be tall enough to deflect an arrow in low light. Okay, that's lane three, and that one needed almost nothing. Uh, we had to do almost zero clearing there. A couple stuff up here tall, up high on that maple, and a little bit on that oak, and that was it. Okay, this here is uh, shooting lane number four. We were gonna do three, I thought. We ended up doing four. Uh, one's really minor. Uh, also, even though we're doing, I'm doing a segment on saws, I, I just got to reiterate, this here's a three section, 16 foot silky. This is the baddest ass saw there is. If somebody wants to make a good investment, you're looking at 250 bucks probably, get a silky saw. I mean, you can take branches out that are two inches in diameter with three simple swipes. It's damn near as fast as a chainsaw and you don't have to carry the damn chainsaw around. So, has nothing to do with, these shooting lanes, but we used them to clear them out. Silky saws are bad. They're the baddest ones out there. Okay, I'm getting ready to prep this tree. We've been uh, clearing the shooting lanes. Now it's time to prep the tree. Just want to show what I'm prepping it with. Uh, I've hunted this guy's property for a few years and he lets me use spikes as long as it's not in a nice tree in the timber. And I always hunt in the swamp, so nobody's gonna come out here cutting wood. So he lets me use these 3 8 inch by 10 inch long spikes and uh, you can buy these by the 50 pound box. I do anyway at hardware stores, you have to special order them. They usually don't have them. It's about a hundred bucks for 50 pounds and that's a lot of steps. That's probably 300 of these. And as long as you weigh under 165 pounds, these will work phenomenal. And I use a 3 8 inch drill, drill bit I should say. Got a DeWalt. This one here is just an 18 volt. Really important, the bit. This here is an Irwin bit. I don't know if you can see that on there. It's an Irwin 3 8 inch wood bit. And they're kind of pricey. They're about eight bucks a piece. And if you can zoom in on that, you can see it's got threads. It's got threads on the tip. So once you get this thing started, you don't have to push at all. It self taps itself. It just self, self drills. Then once I get it in so far, usually about that far, I just pull it out with all the, with all the shavings. And then I'll take, take one of the steps and tap it in with a, with a hatchet. This is an east wing hatchet. Cost me about 40 bucks. I use this for trimming rough bark around where I'm actually going to hunt in, this, in my saddle uh, so I don't make any noise around my steps, uh, any place even if I'm going to use a stick wherever my foot will hit the side of the tree going up the tree with a stick. I usually try and trim as much rough bark so I can get up the tree as quietly as possible. Uh, awesome hatchet, but uh, make sure if you're going to use these bits or you're going to use these spikes because in the long term, you know, I've probably prep prepped at least 500 trees with spikes in my life. Uh, saves a lot of money. Tree steps are really expensive. I love trees, screw in tree steps, but uh, man, if, if you're hunting property and the property owner will let you use spikes, um, go for it because it sa saves a ton of money. And also they last longer. The cool thing about a spike, uh, if you put a whole three inches, you got a 10 inch spike, you got seven inches sticking out. As the tree grows, the tree just grows and the spike remains straight out so it doesn't change. You put a step in a tree, and as the tree grows on Z-style steps, which is our conventional steps, the tree will grow around the side panel of the step, and your step will get really short really fast because the step itself is like five inches. And if you use folding steps, the step itself as a tree grows will tip up like that after about two years. If it's in a maple or a popple, two years, it's, your step is, is gonna be up like this as opposed to down like this when you put it in. Whereas these here, you put this three inches into a tree, you got seven inches sticking out. This is gonna last probably about eight years before you have to put another one in next to it. So these last a long time and they're really cheap. Okay, I have, uh, I've turned on a couple of heavy guys to these spikes too. And uh, they can't use three eighths inch spikes. You know, some guys weigh like two, 220, 250. So 
what they have done is they bought these Irwin speed bits, st speed uh, drill bits, and they've bought half inch bits as opposed to three eighths. And they're using half inch re-rod. So they'll cut the re-rod into 10 inch chunks and that'll support 250 pounds with no problem. And they use the half inch instead of a three eighths inch bit. Recording. Okay, as I'm looking at this tree, see how it's got a slight lean to it? That means we're gonna go up the side that leans, like you're going up the side of a ladder. So we're gonna go up the side, and then once it makes this first crotch, it leans actually a little bit more, we're gonna go up the leaning side again, until we get up into that second crotch. And then we're gonna be up on that, the, the crotch to the right, because that's kind of the straightest. When you're actually up a, into where you wanna sit, um, having a slight lean's fine, uh, straight to a slight lean is really good. A hard lean kind of limits you going around the tree. But you always want to go up the tree, put your steps in or your sticks or whatever. Go up the leaning side just like you're going to be going up a ladder. Because your body is always pulling when you're going up, your upper body is pulling away from the tree. And especially if you're on something leans like that and you're going up the, the back side of the lean, your body's always wanting to pull you away from the tree, and it's it's just dangerous to climb that way, especially if you're using anything smooth. It's really simple, especially if the steps are wet or sticks are wet or they got some ice on them because your body is just wanting to force you away from the tree because of the lean, uh, it's just not as safe. It's just always safer and easier going up the side that leans like the ladder. Okay, so right now we're I like to keep my steps about knee high. Uh, I don't know what that height is um, So right now we're gonna have a step here Next step goes in here. Watch how easy this goes in. I am putting no pressure on that whatsoever It is going in totally 100 by itself 100% by itself So that's three. Four. So I got four. You can put four steps in without having to hook to the tree yet. And to put the step in, you just start it in the hole. Ours, things finding your holes. Obviously, I was never a roofer. Now, once you put these in, they're there forever. So uh, keep that in mind. After you hunt about six to eight years, this tree will grow out into here, and then you have to put another step next to it. But these steps, you're not gonna pull them out. It's not like some of those drills where you can drill a hole, just slide it in by hand, and then pull it out when you come back down. These, uh, this bit is a little bit tighter. Okay, here's another whiteboard. Make me a pointer here. This one's a little simpler because uh, this one was pretty much all marsh. This is one that we just prepared. Um, showed you uh, kind of film showing the shooting lanes making before and after shooting lanes, the tree. And it was a maple tree on a little piece of high ground in the middle of a swamp. So there was some open timber to the west. Um, eh, it's probably 80 yards to the west. Um, everything north and south 
is marsh. There's a river, not a really big river, not real wide anyway, it's pretty deep. There's a river flowing down, it kind of meanders through the, through the edge of this marsh on the, to the east. And there's marsh on the other side of the river, east side of the river as well. And anyway, this is all cattails, all marsh grass. Same up here. And then right here was a piece of high ground. And there was a maple tree, which is what we filmed prepping and clearing the shooting lanes. And there was a bunch, there was quite a few bur oaks between that maple tree and the river. And the reason I chose the maple tree as opposed to being up one of these bur oaks, because these bur oaks were actually big enough to hunt from. But there was, if I were to get in any of these bur oaks, there was just a lot more stuff that had to be cleared out for shooting lanes. Plus, from that maple, it was about 30 yards to the river. So by staying about 30, that's about my shooting distance. I, by staying in that maple, I had a lot more open area over here to the west and to the north. I had natural shooting lanes. I really didn't have to do much for shooting lanes. So I only had to make shooting lanes this direction and to the south. Whereas if I would have got in the bur oaks and it would have been a 15 yard shot to the river, then I would have only had 30 yards to shoot this direction. So I basically would have had a 45 yard zone I could have shot by, having in the, by being in this maple, it did a several things. It gave me a 60 yard shooting range east to west as opposed to 45 and it, again, I didn't have to clear as much stuff because if I had prepped something here, I'd have had to clear shooting lanes going that way, that way, this way, and that way, you know, 90 degrees each direction. So from this, I only had to really clear shooting lanes going south and going east because these north and going west, those were pretty open because it was more marshy. The trees weren't really in that, in that area. They were to the east. So anyway, I prepped that location and then Directly south of that maple, there was a huge fell tree. It was, that tree was probably 60 or 70 feet long and it was that big around and it was up off the ground like that high. It was big enough where, and it fell just perfectly east and west. It was big enough where deer are not gonna go over it and they couldn't go under it. So the deer had to skirt the outside edge one direction or the other. And because of where that maple was, I actually got that off a little bit. That maple is probably right in here. The maple was pretty much centered. On e if you took each side of that fell tree, uh, the maple was due north pretty much in the center. So it was more about right into there. So there was a runway going right up the edge. There's runways coming out of this marsh going straight up the edge, just cutting the edge of that, the end of that tree that way and the end of the tree this way. So that put them, because that, that was a really big tree, uh, if when they continued going north, after they skirted around those edges, you know, those are like 10 to 15 yard runways from my tree. So I had a 30 yard, 25 to 35 yard shot to the river. And there's almost always any, any place I think I've ever prepped where there was a river, there was a, some form of a runway skirt in the edge, some place close to the edge of the river where deer followed the edge of that river. Cause usually along the river, there's good security cover and they can scent check where deer crossed the river. Cause this was a river that was, it's not too hard to cross. Um, it's a little mucky, but deer could cross it pretty easy. So anyway, there was runways going on each side of that fell tree. There was runways coming down the edge of the river this way, which were within shooting distance. There was three or four runways going just due north and due south, even over here a little farther over. I just showed what, three or four runways there. There was probably eight different runways within shooting distance of that maple tree. And again, it was centered in everything around here is security cover. I'm a huge security cover guy. So marsh grass, cattails, water, dry humps, uh, um, I've scouted quite a few places this spring that, that actually had that. And there was a feeder creek coming just about due east-west that attached to this river through this marsh. 
Um, unfortunately, there was also a runway along the edge of that creek, but I couldn't shoot it from that. And there were, there were no trees around there, but that was just one runway. Whereas all these other runways going north and south, pretty much I could shoot to all of them from that maple tree. Uh, I'm up in that maple, probably 25 feet to my feet. Um, it's not quite as big a diameter as I would like. Uh, but that's all there was and I'll just have to be very cautious and and one thing cool about About that kind of a location. You got a big visual You can see up and down through that marsh for a long long ways So it's not like something's gonna boom. It's right on top of you. You can prepare to be quiet You can prepare to move around the tree and be on the back side in your saddle uh, Really cool thing about a saddle is you can use a tree as a blocker so um, I definitely expect to kill something out of that tree. Uh, hopefully it's this year uh, last two years in Michigan, I have not even seen a shooter buck. So I obviously haven't killed anything, but uh, I'm due for a change. And I, I sure as hell hope it's this year because I've sucked the last couple of years. And I want to change that. That's not cool. So anyway, that's the location we just prepped. And uh, this, is the, this is basically the whiteboard of the location to go along with the actual video of prepping the lanes and the tree. I hope you're as successful this year as well. That's what this is all about, making everybody better hunters. Take care. Thanks for watching another episode of Eberhard Outdoors and please like and subscribe.